Um, tonight is the launch of my book, Where the Beast is Buried, and um, um, I'm quite excited about it because this is my, this is my entry to, to, to the public sphere of, of this country. <laughs> British sculptors like uh, Jane and Louise Wilson also deal with derelict spaces, like they've made Stasi City uh, and so on. But in all of this work, there are no people. And what's extraordinary about Joanna is that the work has people in it all the time, people who live in the spaces, people who come to visit the spaces. I think I'm bringing something here, after all. It's, it's, it's a different understanding of publicness. It's, a, I think, a quite new approach uh, towards public space and people participating in it. It's that interaction with people which I think makes her work really, really special to me. Um, in the piece I wrote about it, I called it relational aesthetics. But I've been thinking since then that actually a better term is sort of trans subjectivity because relational aesthetics has a long history in England of political work. Uh, the other thing I think is really exciting about Joanna is she looks at the afterlife of projects. Very few sculptors, artists even do that. The work's there, it's gone, they're on to the next thing. And Joanna comes back to the work and talks to people about the work and what they're thinking about it and looks at the space. And so the work, it's more about the process, I think, than about a finished project. <laughs> I come from a new democracy, from a, a different type of democracy. I think the uh, public space there is much more dynamic. Things are still possible. Uh, there's this notion in the air that things might be changed and should be changed, whereas here things are more or less crystallized. It's very hard to introduce something that undermines the, the, the situation, that um, undermines people's uh, position and their, um, well, their situation, their position in society <laughs> in a, and, the, and the way they participate in it. Um, and apart from everything else, it's about art from Eastern Europe because art is a political social tool that I use uh, in public space. We have fantastic pleasure to have with us uh, Joanna Rajkowska who will be telling us, presenting her new book and uh, the the new book, Where the Beast is Buried. But we will try to talk about this book um, in the context of um, public space. And we thought with Joanna it's very, very important to, to talk about public space or to talk about these general categories, which are artistic but also social categories, in terms of migration. Jan is without doubt one of the greatest uh, artists in Poland uh, today. I mean, today she's in Britain, but uh, Polish artists. And um, the objects she created, um, the art she creates, is uh, is known to anyone living in Warsaw, Konya, or Łódź. Uh, and um, the objects she created are used by um, various political, artistic, and social groups. But today, I'd like us to focus on. The, um, the role her art plays in the creation of um, public sphere, public space, and uh, what you uh, understand as public space. Um, so having you as one of our speakers today, I'd like you to sort of present your projects briefly. Um, I know we have a selection of uh, projects you'd like to talk about, and then we'll use that for further discussion. Uh, so the piece started in 2007, as I remember, in Poland, and in Polish. I was asked to uh, give a presentation about my projects uh, by one of the left-wing groups, uh, Krytyka Polityczna, which I did, and then I was asked to simply write it down, which took two years. And then the first, The Mother of the Beast was created, was written in 2009, and was published as a, in a series of uh, guides that Krytyka Polityczna published at that time. Um, and, but The Mother was, was very different than the book uh, which is here today, uh, mainly because it, was about public projects that were mainly realized in Poland or in Eastern Europe, which is, and again, coming back to what Kinga said, it's extremely different public spaces, di different understanding of publicness, different understanding of what's possible in general. So uh, this piece is, is more difficult and more, more painful, not only because I'm older, I became a mother, and I decided from 
this British point of view to introduce um, um, subjects that is it's not that easy as it seems, mainly, uh, namely um, physicality, motherhood, um, uh, pain in general, as, as my doctor is not quite healthy. And uh, all these issues, uh, may, I would say, a resistance. So most of this project were not realized. And the book is also about this un unrealized project, some of them utopian, some of them not. Uh, I will go briefly through, through the projects that are in the book, because the book is actually a collection of tales, of narratives. I'm a storyteller. Uh, and um, one of my um, uh, one of the curators that I work with said that actually I, I do art just because I would like to, I, I want to write about it. I hope it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> what you'll find in the book, first of all, is this uh, now a little iconic project that actually might disappear soon from Warsaw, but it's a uh, uh, it's called Greetings from Jerusalem Avenue, and it's it's a result of my first trip to to Middle East, to Israel, uh, during the Second Intifada, and my complete lack of understanding, like, I mean, profound understanding of what's happening there. And also, the, the fact that I realized the loss, that uh, the loss of, the general cultural loss of, of, of Jewish community that will never come back to Poland. So this it's kind of a sign of, of, of this loss. Uh, of course, the palm tree, um, is not read as a as, as 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 a result of my trip and my experience. <coughs> it's completely detached. It's a grown-up uh, individual that has its own uh, or her own life in this case, uh, and uh, has different uh, adventures. I'm completely detached from it now. Uh, it's used very often by political groups uh, to for performances, spectacles, for anything. So that's that. This is the first story that is opening uh, the beast, and and then the the, the the first project that actually I was trying to uh, in which I was trying to deal with very personal, very private matter, um, when my mother lost her ability to speak. So I did this project in, in Paris. It's also in the book. This is 2004, quite long long time ago, and a, a Swedish project project a, a dream about building a mountain, a volcano in the <coughs> in Sweden. Um, which is actually quite flat and creating, of course, it wouldn't be the size of, of that mountain that you see on the slide, but it was uh, it was going to be a quite a functional mountain where people can meet and uh, make a fire and thus make a presence of the, volca of the volcano, uh, which of course wasn't realized. It was uh, quite utopian, but not, not impossible. This, this project was actually a, a, a month-long workshop in, in Jenin, in, in the West Bank, uh, in 2008, where I decided to tackle a trauma again. In this, time, in this case, a trauma that it wasn't a distant trauma. It was a trauma of Second Intifada of 2002, where I actually was there, but not in Palestine. I was in Israel. But I wanted to, to see the other side. And I went to Janine and decided to actually work with a group of teenagers. And again, I was trying not to use language. I asked them not to talk, not to talk to me, not to tell me what happened, but rather to perform it, uh, use the body gestures, movements, non-articulated sounds, and uh, in a way reenact the trauma and get rid of it. But th that was a lesson that a traumatic experience being reenacted need fiction and, and fantasy more than anything else. And uh, my attempt to turn uh, a building, quite a gloomy b building in the, in the former East Germany in Uchust, into a refugee camp. Um, a refugee, Isalum, actually, um, which met a little resistance from the from the, the, the village inhabitants. But finally, we managed to put a banner uh, on the back of the building, since in, 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 in front of the building there was a church, a church didn't want to really see the banner. Um, I learned afterwards that actually, in the, media, in, in the, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, the village was offered to to welcome 110 refugees from all over the world, and it refused. So, um, subconsciously, I think I, I touched a, a painful spot in the history of the of the place. And a story about my mother uh, that I reenacted in a film called Fascia in 2009, uh, where she wanted to escape from a psychiatric clinic. Um, this is actually very very short story, 
a dream about building a minaret in one of the most right-wing cities in Poland, in Poznan, where a Catholic church finally said no. And we, after three years' struggle, uh, we actually gave up on it completely. Uh, and the project in Turkey, in a completely different public space, where uh, there's a different level of control, that the space is negotiated in a different way. Uh, it's, a, it's a project um, in, the, in the very center of the city, in the central square, where I, uh, I had this idea to translate the, the um, Walter Benjamin text about the task of the translator back into, well, not back, but into a diff, uh, now non-existent or uh, not functioning uh, Ottoman language, uh, Turkish Ottoman. Uh, so because the, the text was, uh, was perceived as something, something holy, I had to cover it with water. The water was swirling around the text and protecting it. There were actually three translations to modern Turkish, to Ottoman Turkish, and to uh, and the original German text. Uh, so there was a pool, kind of a pool. Uh, that's a longer story. This is this is my response to to um, Nazi headquarters. Uh, it's called uh, Last Summer in Obersalzberg, where Hitler had his uh, summer retreat. And I, I was uh, completely overwhelmed by the place, and I decided to, to take a, a series of pornographic pictures with my partner. It's one of them, <coughs> because I thought it's a, it's, yeah, in a way, it's a, it's a shame. It's a shame to be there, and this shame needs to be, needed to be exposed. Um, and another unrealized project from Poland, from the Oista, very, very much right-wing city again, where finally, after, after a long, period of negotiations, I, I proposed something completely impossible for them to accept, a monument, a communist monument. This is exactly what they, what they feared the most, the, the comeback of communism, so of course I didn't do it. And this, again, is Berlin and my film about, um, about uh, Rosa being born there, my daughter, because I decided to bring, to bring her to Berlin, to, in a way, plant her in a Berlin soil, to act against my own memories and my own uh, convictions about uh, how toxic this place was. Of course, the, the destruction traditionally came from, from Berlin to, to Poland, so I thought bringing life there would be, in a way, counteracting and uh, uh, really transforming, rendering the memories. Uh, here I swim in a, um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a sports stadium, you know, the, uh, what is it called, the... Um, yeah, Olympic Stadium. Yeah, Olympic Stadium. Uh, uh, Reenacting Leni Riefenstahl, a famous jumps during the Olympics in 1936. Uh, of course, I didn't jump because, um, yeah, uh, it was too high. <coughs> <laughs> and this is Final Fantasy. It's one of the last stories. Uh, I decided to, um, for some reason, was really focused on the end, at the moment when the when the life ends, the, the last moments, and I thought. It would be great to to be able to choose how people want to die and where want they want to die, because uh, that is almost always accidental. It just happens where we are. But if they know that they were going to die, maybe my duty is to create this situation, this environment, where they could actually die as they want. So we managed to actually get a permission and, and uh, invite a, one person who was willing to participate in, in this project, and uh, we went to um, Halle, Halle Saale in, in former East Germany, and we brought back this film, filmed on Super 8. Uh, it was just a house where he was born. And this one here is the Peterborough child, uh, the Peterborough child that has not been realized. It's a, it's, a, it's a fake archaeological site designed for the city of Peterborough here in Britain. Um, a, a, a fantasy again about a burial site, three and a three, three thousand, three and a half thousand years old, uh, where a child was buried, uh, suffering uh, from exactly the same disease as my as my child uh, suffers. It was kind of a deal with reality that it, that it wouldn't happen. But you know, if I write the scenario for that, it will never happen. Um, and. Uh, since I was dealing with a very orthodox Muslim area, the young, young orthodox Muslim women really opposed the project, saying that we do not open the graves, we do not touch the dead. That was the, actually the end of the project. And against all the democratic 
procedures, the project has been has, has been stopped, and uh, the, the future of this project is really unclear at the moment. And the last one is uh, freeze last year as well. It's a it's a pool of, of instances, burning instances. That was a kind of a uh, an attempt to activate the ground, the soil, in terms of uh, my own wish to actually help uh, help Rosa to overcome the, uh, the the difficulties now after chemotherapies and uh, after the whole um, uh, treatment. Um, but at the same time, it's, it, it's just, this project is quite similar to the oxygenator that I showed you at first. It just creates an, uh, a, a site, a, a place, a situation where people can be very much at ease with themselves and they sit down and forget about everything else except, you know, and just be in touch with, with themselves, they, they well, beings. This is Bern, uh, a, a very interesting city in terms of uh, presence of animals there everywhere. Um, and a city with really beautiful 19th century bridges, you know, really majestic uh, bridges, very tall, very beautiful. And what caught my attention was the, uh, the cemetery. Uh, <coughs> it's actually in, in Jura Mountains uh, where I went. And all of a sudden I saw this place. It's a, it's a well, it's, it's actually, it's very hard to describe it because uh, it, it has kind of an accidental form of a, of a circle, has a stone with nothing written on it, and it has a plant pot which, up, which covers something. And this this cover it looks exactly like the sewage cover on the street, on the street nearby. And I realized that this is a place where they deposit the human ashes. And this was quite, uh, quite embarrassing actually. That there is no script, no ritual, nothing that people invented just actually to to honor the dead at this point. That you know the cemetery is, uh, uh, is probably very functional. Um, and I started to think about the death of my own mother, who really wanted to. To dissolve in something to after her death, she definitely didn't want to end up as she did, you know, under a heavy, heavy granite uh, uh, piece of, you know, of, 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 of you know, a, a heavy object. Uh, you know, maybe I should do something about it. Maybe I should do something for my mother who died and who, you know, who's actually buried in the most conventional way in a grave and probably suffers terribly because of it. And I decided to on that her decided to design a grave for her, a grave that she would never use, but, but maybe other people will use. My mother, my mother suffered of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, she gradually lost her memory. And there was a, a leading figure, basically, in my life, and also in the, in the book, as a person who, uh, who taught me how to recognize places, actually, in terms of their qualities, in terms of their uh, receptiveness in terms of their safety. I mean, completely irrational mental sa safety. But she's she's absolutely the key figure in in in, in my art. And I, as you see, she she has this uh, uh, this funny outfit. She's trying to cover herself. And I thought maybe this animal that is around her neck should be my should be my direction. I started to paint it. Uh, I mean, that's the heart. But she lost. Uh, she uses used to use a lot of you know, dairy things. Uh, and I thought more and more about animals since I was there in Bern. And um, decided to, co you know, to uh, find, uh, search for images of the bats, sleeping bats, because they are night creatures, because they have, they are able to locate themselves in space despite the fact that they don't see well. And uh, she was, uh, she was one of those lost creatures that couldn't really find her way. And I thought maybe, I should actually create a grave in the, in the form of this animal, of a bat. So, no, there were many attempts, as you see, on the Ever Bridge. I saw this bat hanging down. It would have a, a drawer where you deposit the ashes, you know, safe kind of staircase to, well, an axis. Uh, and finally, finally, I decided to use this most magnificent bridge, Cornhouse Bricker. Uh, where I lived, actually, nearby. It's incredible that actually your experience seems to suggest um, that it might be more difficult to, despite all the legal difficulties, all the, uh, you know, all the legal fiction that is there to promote um, art and experiment, um, you were more successful in, in sort of new democracies. Well, this is true. Um, well, I think about, always about level of control here where every square centimetre of the ground is strictly controlled by hundreds of regulations and uh, therefore 
almost nothing is possible. And uh, the, when we were working on the uh, Freeze project in 2012, that what really paralyzed us at, any, at every step was the anticipation of the problems. They were even stronger and more, uh, you know, pervasive than the, the problems themselves. And then finally, they stopped the project. Uh, so uh, I think that thanks to chaos and lack of regulations, uh, that slots it between these impossibilities in Eastern Europe, especially where you can actually sneak in and you know go forward and do something. Mm. The fact that the work is being shut down or rejected or stops at the level of a proposal, to me, is part of the intelligence and the efficiency of the work in highlighting that there is a problem and that we just don't want to engage with it. But it puts us very beautifully face to face with this. Uh, in your writing, actually, it's so suggestive that, you know, actually, when I read it through the, the, you know, the whole book, and then it seems like uh, these projects are so alive that, you know, I would never have a chance to go, for example, to Turkey or even to Peterborough. But when I read about the project, it seems it's there. It's, it's you know, I can't imagine it's not existent. And I was very intrigued when you were talking and you said that the writing comes after the project because what's so vivid in these chapters is it's as if it's happening each time as you're coming in. It's like almost like a kind of continuous present tense. And what's so interesting is that you're talking about the afterlife of projects. Very few artists really deal with the afterlife, about how these were approached by people who lived there, how their own bodies were changed, how their experiences were changed, and then you revisit spaces. I mean, that's, that's incredibly uh, radical, incredibly unusual, I think. And the projects themselves are in no way antagonizing. They are embodied, they are based on experience, they actually make a point um, to work with that tension of language. So in the project itself, language is pushed out, or sometimes engaged with in a way that's more about the experience of the language than the language as an abstracted mode of translation of experience. Why there is this fear of, of 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 conflict, of a debate, of you know, of something that really makes us feel alive. This is, I now for us coming from Eastern Europe, this is unthinkable. This is absolutely unthinkable. This is the end of democracy. But what would you expect from the viewer uh, on a daily basis? I don't know. Bring the newspaper and then say, "Listen, <laughs> for me, this is this is too much. Uh, can we have a, you know, a press conference about it? Can you, you know, make a round table and invite an artist, a curator, the Berlin Biennale curator? Can we talk about it? That would be normal for me. I I was accused many times that I act against the commu a community rules, and of course I do, with a full consciousness against political correctness." I cannot agree with the fact that there is something better or you know something more right than a, a human to human contact. And I, I really this is beyond my capacity, my mental capacity. But what my question about uh, trauma was trying to get at was um, do we, I mean we obviously give people communities the right to say no, we do not want that in our community, right? I mean I think uh, if we have a sort of democratic uh, mechanism of you know debate that I would be fine with that you know exactly. people meeting up saying no this this is we don't believe in it whatever that's mm -hmm. against our principles but that's not what is happening most of the times what's happening is that people walk away there's this that 17,000 households no one was notified about the project coming to the area this was the problem because I work what I call horizontally I always if I have to Oh, I, when I feel this is appropriate, because sometimes it really is necessary to tell people that it, something is coming to their space in the, you know, their area, and that I will be there, I will tell them what it is about, I will somehow tame the reactions. And this is what I wanted to do. I wanted. I told the RSA, the, the Royal Society of Arts, that was the, commissioning the project, uh, I said, let's, you know, let's just send 17,000 letters to 17,000 households. And, you know, let's set up two meetings, uh, organize two meetings in the community centers, and let's see what they say. And this horizontal way didn't work at all. They wanted to notify the, 
the councillors, they are community mm -hmm. leaders, where we got stuck and we never actually got to these people. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I don't know what they think. Is, is there an advantage to being, to coming in a community and being the other, being an artist, coming from a different background, mm -hmm. economically, culturally? Isn't there an advantage in the sense that if anger is provoked, well, it can come from difference, can't it? And is that something we should engage with? Well, it's, it's a good <coughs> to be a misfit, you know, in general, of course, because you have an instrument in your hands, you know, which is actually yourself, your uh, unwelcome presence. That's, that's a tool, you know, that's, a, that's nice. But on the other hand, it's quite embarrassing when you cannot contact these people and talk, speak to them properly in their own language. The, the way I read your work is that you're responding to public space that's um, often uh, rather regimented. Uh, some, sometimes it's a very tense form of regimentation, of covering up things, and you're trying to, to break that space open. Well, that's my reading of some of the projects that you're doing, and you're inserting um, sometimes very private um, things, uh, traumatic experience, into that public sphere, sphere to be seen by others, whereas the impulses are to cover them up. Mm -hmm. There are two levels uh, on which I operate. One is, uh, one is kind of general notion of where I should be. You know, you go to hospital, you go to the nursing home, uh, you see people dying in a hospice, and and you think, why, why there's no art here? Why well, understand that we have a history of sort of dissolution and closure, of clearance. Everything is like privately owned. Even spaces where the public are, there are pavements, there are studs in the floor, there are security guards saying, do this, don't do that. Is there such, you know, there's very little common land. There are, there are heats in, in, in the city. <laughs> There are parks, but everything is sort is, is managed, is controlled, is owned. So there aren't any sort of common spaces or neutral areas where people can come together where there aren't where there is an opportunity for art to happen. Is that different from East uh, East different from Poland? I don't know actually. Well, there are areas in Britain that are public, and that is right of way, mm. Ramblers Pathways, and they are they cannot be touched by law, and you could create uh, art on pathways, um, and they've got long histories that go <laughs> very far back. would be brilliant. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's, I dream about a situation where actually something that is non-public becomes public again. Uh, it's a task by itself, isn't it? It's <laughs> the only reason why you would say that there is more of a public space in Poland is because there are, there are less rules and regulations. That's the only reason, because mm -hmm. it, yes, it's, it's, ter it's not in terms of what's actually private and what's actually public. It's yeah. more like what what's not forbidden. When, whenever you are in Warsaw, mm -hmm. particularly newly built districts, these are gated communities, which actually make moving across specific districts extremely difficult, even entering from one street to another. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow pessimistic, actually, about this Eastern European phenomenon and what I think the last outburst of despair or to populate public space, which takes place right now in Kiev, actually shows you, is that this is exactly the, the society and the politics which, to some extent, perhaps are standing 15, 20 years behind of what, in, in what you have in places like Poland, in places like Hungary where this process of abdicating from public spaces I think takes place. So if I could hear your comments on this. Okay. But, you know, I went to Lublin in, uh, last year, in, in actually in September, and I found a place where it used to be a communist monument of Pieru, put up there in the 80s, a very late monument, which was of course dismantled shortly after. Um, it's a huge space, residential buildings on the top, uh, in a valley, in the, the valley, and then the, uh, the, the foundation of the non-existent monument, and your carriageway. And I thought, that's great, I'm going to just 
you know, make a section of a river. Let's just put, you know, water through it, starting on the top, you know, and then ending at the bottom. And everyone said, oh, there must be a plan for this place. It's pretty central. And we checked. There was no plan. <laughs> it's fantastic. We can do it, you know. Yeah, so over, it's, over still mm -hmm. it's still possible. It's still possible. Joe, being misfit, why do you? Ah, feel God, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm a mixture myself, and uh, genetically. So, and but I feel extremely, also actually, not so much Polish because Poland has many, many, many faces. But you know, I'm not. I wasn't even born there. But my family, family has seven generation of dentists come from Warsaw. <laughs> 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 Because we lost everything during the war, and uh, um, yeah, the whole family was uh, the, the, the buildings were bombed, and then my family was forced away, and then I ended up in Bydgoszcz, in, in a city with absolutely this kind of a post-German thing, uh, with no uh, real identity. I decided to go back, and I went back to, to Warsaw. And when I saw Jerusalem Avenue, I was absolutely astonished. I love this bit when you say, oh, uh, and I was this you know, poor student, or whatever, and I had moved to Warsaw, and I felt like I had to live at Jerusalem Avenue, which is like, I had to live at Oxford Street. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I just felt I had to, and so I did. <laughs> no, I rented the flat because of the name of the street. Yeah, it was, uh, it was gorgeous. No, I felt definitely a route, a long, long seven generations <laughs> route. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah. I'm a product of the city. most moving parts of the books, book uh, are those where Joanna says about her own feelings and about her own her family history. It is actually very sensitive, intelligent work that allows people from very different backgrounds, not strictly from the arts or from academia, to really question the notion of immigration, the notion of migration. Her projects are extremely site-specific and they they touch the very to the very very roots of the local communities she's working with they, her pieces actually ask the questions but they ask the questions oh, yeah. without all the weight of preconceived ideas and they allow us to experience what it is like to be the other and what it is like to have an embodied experience of being the other and then to question that and the notion of embodiment I think is very important to her work it's all well and good to have uh, conceptual theoretical discussions about these issues